Put yourself back in time to the year 2014. Nothing in Destiny had been established, and if you were to watch an ad for the game, you'd probably think it was selling itself as this hybrid of Halo and Call of Duty, especially with the array of multiplayer modes in the game that combined these two types of games together. But it also had influence from Borderlands and Diablo and... Then the Vault of Glass released, and after beating this raid, you realized, dang man, Destiny has its own identity. A game that had gone through so many different waves of development hell was still able to pull off an activity that would latch so many people in and just hook the player base like nothing ever before in an FPS. You see, Borderlands was a lot of fun the first few times you experienced it. But for most people, once the journey was done, that was all she wrote. But in Destiny, Bungie just said screw it and made a broken vanilla story with all the content at the very end. A game that was made for those who could sift through all that frustrating jargon in order to peel back the layers of satisfying progression that didn't hold your hand like other AAA games at the time were being criticized for. The balls on this game at launch were met with some bad reviews among critics and fans that expected Destiny to be Halo and Call of Duty. But just remember, most critics are from publications that don't explore the end game and can't properly give time for games to sink in before they have to move on to the next one, and fans who, to be fair, weren't prepared for what this game was aiming to be. So, for those who fell in love with this game like myself and millions of others, finding the raid activity like the Vault of Glass was eye-opening and jaw-dropping. It was nothing like the rest of the game outside of some nightfalls and strikes, but it didn't just challenge three of us, no, it challenged six of us to work together in team build to complete the mission. It was made for a specific type of player, but I think anyone that experienced it found something to love. Monte Carlo? You got a Monte Carlo? You have like eight Monte Carlos. I'll take a Monte Carlo. You got plan C? Ah! No matter how much of a pain it was to get six friends on the same page to play. So when Bungie announced that with the December 9th DLC, The Dark Below, a new raid against the High Prince would be coming, and we wanted nothing more than to get in there and prove again why Destiny raids were special. So without further ado, I want to welcome you to Crota's End, the most controversial raid ever made. Some footage in this video is from players around the community. Their links will be in the description of this video, as well as the music too. We just hit 80,000 subscribers here on the channel, so thank you so much for all the love, and if you want to support me, a like and a sub goes a long way. Thank you, and enjoy the video. I remember this day like it was yesterday. December 8th, 2014, the day my innocence of destiny was at its peak, the last day before I knew what the dark below was all about. The following day of December 9th was really, really fun, until you realize that the dark below was only four missions long, with some missions being extremely short like the Fist of Crota. The cool factor in this DLC was getting to see the first ever Rasputin bunker for the first time, but the charm kind of wore off after a few times through. So this expansion really was going to boil down to the end game again. So how many strikes were introduced? Two, I, I, I mean two if you're on PlayStation, as you got the undying mind in the will of Crota to listen to Omnigo's sweet, harmonious voice while Xbox only got that voice. That is loud. Wow. How about Crucible? Well, 
a respectable three maps in Pantheon, Skyshock, and Cauldron were introduced. Exotics? A lot of exotics. This is what I'm talking about with the endgame grind. They're staples of the series like the Fourth Horseman for PS4, Dragon's Breath, and No Land Beyond. While on the gear side, there was three pieces for each class, from the Glass House and Ruin Wings for Titan, Obsidian Mine and Starfire Protocol for Warlock, Don't Touch Me's, and the Holy Shoot It Now helmet for Hunters. Aside from this, there was a farm that players were doing for this extremely rare and odd common white looking weapon called the Husk of the Pit. But more on that later. The story of the Dark Below takes place after the destruction of the Black Garden's heart. Eris Morn lands in the tower. As a former guardian, Eris warns the tower of the return of Crota, a high prince that is worshipped as a god. Eris is the only known survivor of a failed raid to kill Crota and had to become part Hive in order to escape the pit. She requests the Guardians to purge some of the Hive on Earth by killing the Fist of Crota. Although killing the Fist of Crota did stop some Hive, the remaining Hive attempt to take over Rasputin. The siege is led by Omnigol, the Will of Crota, and the Might of Crota aka Ogre Man. After killing the Might of Crota, Guardians hunt down Omnigol. Eris then sees the Guardians as ready to stop the Hive on the Moon from resurrecting Crota. The Guardians seek out the soul of Crota and destroy it along with the Hive Wizards trying to resurrect it. Some of my favorite Eris lines actually came out of this DLC, like this one. Crota? They're waking him. The Traveler released the ghosts. Two open doors. It was too late, however, and Crota was ready to be slain by us, the guardians that took down the vaults of glass already. We were to stop this prince at last. So, on the same day as the release of the expansion, my innocence in this series was gone, and Crota was going to meet his end. To Earth, and only a true weapon of the light can stop his wrath. This raid is the most controversial raid in my opinion for reasons we will get to later in the video, but for now, welcome to the Hellmouth, the giant pit in the center of the moon in Destiny, the home of wonder, and the home of sparrow tricks if you had the trick sparrow and knew how to fly across. The Hellmouth was where this raid was to start, and it was a place that in Vanilla Destiny we all wanted to explore. That sense of wonder and hoping that Bungie would one day let these places exist was an awesome feeling when they finally did open them to the player base, just like the Rasputin bunker we listed before. Team Invigorate was a clan of friends who all wanted to test themselves at the game, and while there's almost no footage of the raid outside of the finale, I want to commemorate the world's first team, who was back to back world's first with this clan being the same one to pull off the world's first hard mode of Vaults of Glass. This race was about 6 hours as compared to the original Vault of Glass's 14 hours. This raid was level 30 and I will do my best to try to tell a pretty accurate feel from what the first time experience was like for many players, since when I tried to contact Team Invigorate, I was not able to find any old members to share any details. I'm actually lying. I got into contact while editing this video from X Hawkeye, one of the team's members. He actually recalled that Matrix, one of the members, had saved up a bunch of stuff so we could run around buying gear as soon as the level cap increased, but more on Matrix a bit later. The first encounter of this raid had players forming a small bridge with no enemies around and jumping down into the Hellmouth. The first thing you would have noticed here is that there wasn't any enemies fighting you while capturing the plate, and that even though this was a part of the moon patrol area, it was a different instance where the walls were cut off and no random players could help you. When you formed the bridge and jumped down, this was electric. 
the atmosphere immediately hit you like a bag of bricks and you fell to almost no health in this extremely dark and spooky labyrinth. The goal here was to traverse your way as a team in almost a corkscrew-like manner to reach the top. But how were you going to get there when the room was dark? When you started running, the Weight of Darkness debuff was making it so gliding or double jumping was impossible. And you had a ton of Thrall chasing you. Well, with a variety of strategies. Without getting into cheese methods, this area gave players lots of freedom in how they approached this fight. You could go to the lamps that were not just there for light, but there to take away your debuff. You could sit in the darkness for less adds but more weight on you, or you could simply fall in a hole and die, leaving that last person in your fire team to fend for themselves. Your choice. This area had tons of holes hidden by the darkness, and I can't tell you how many times groups fell in there without knowing or without realizing the debuff was on them. There was something pretty cool here too though. A chest was hidden in one of seven side rooms, with five of the rooms being on the first floor and only two being on the second. These were marked with a simple light, and players who didn't want to do the raid, but wanted the chance at an exotic, would start the raid and come down here to grab the loot and get the heck out. Back to the fight though. Once you made it past all the thrall and got to the end of the second floor, there was a knight that if you were under leveled for, and you probably were under leveled, remember it's the chase for 30, this knight would basically one shot you. Considering most teams only had one or two people make it this far in the early days of the raid, this meant start over. If you did get past this knight and avoid that hole on the hill, you made it to the final lamp in front of a plate. This plate would be the stand you needed to make against the waves of thrall, knights, and wizards. The thing here is that you didn't need to just stand on the plate the whole time to activate the bridge. You just needed to touch it once and then hang out and kill the adds. This led to so many strategies from hiding behind the pillar in a Saint-14 bubble for blinding enemies to just saying screw these enemies, I'm gonna jump on a rock and get it. I think oh, Where the f did I go, bro? Evan, you just fell <laughs> from the sky. <laughs> Once the bridge was done forming, it was a mad dash across as your weight of darkness was lifted and a sprint to the blinding white light ahead. If I had to say something about the end section here, it said it was designed to culminate all the tension, but it's odd that they didn't require players to hold the plate to form the bridge. Maybe it said it would be too difficult for players or just an oversight. You tell me. For Team Invigorate here, the journey through here was actually pretty predictable and easy. Hawkeye told me that, quote, the mechanics of the dark room were so obvious that it only took us a few attempts to get past. Sounds like they were really ready to go. Anyways, once across the bridge, you were now in the throne world of Crota. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> love <laughs> Stops dead. I'm gonna let him die by one for all. Yeah, we're fine. We're fine. I made it. Are you joking? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Bridge of Crota, the place where totems are introduced, and so are two types of brand new enemies to Destiny. The first of these enemies is the Swordbearer Knights who, you guessed it, wield a sword in hand. These knights were yellow barred and were pretty tough to kill if you weren't decked out. The other new enemy was waiting on the other side of the bridge, but before we get to the other new enemy, we must discuss the way this encounter works. By today's standards, this encounter is not that interesting, and by those days standards, this encounter is not that interesting. Let me explain. So this encounter had a plate to stand on in the middle and two totems, one on the left, one on the right. When a player stands on the plate, the two totems must have a player under them or you will lose your super and die. By standing on this plate, you are raising a bridge to get across, but if you just try to cross without an item, you will be killed. So the item you need is actually, wow, the sword from the sword bearers. When you grab the sword relic, you are good to cross. 
but once there, a new challenger approaches. This one is a blue crystal knight, and to me, the coolest looking knights in all of Destiny. A brand new enemy to the game, Gatekeepers. Gatekeepers were rather simple knights with one main mechanic. They could only be killed by the relic, and the relic only lasted long enough to kill one, maybe two, if you're a god, three. For Team Invigorate and most of us on day one, these enemies were not easy to kill in the slightest, and two hits from them and you were dead. Once three players made it across the bridge, avoiding enemies and killing the sword bearer, a similar plate with two totems was on the other side. And yeah, it's more of the same. But once all players were across, two ogres and three wizards came out to attack you, along with a bunch of yellow bar knights to kill. This is really where the first mechanic for Invigorate had to be discovered, as quote, the second part where you have to form the bridge and fight the champion was less obvious, but Nick Tizzy Bear figured out that based on the name of the zone that popped up where you crossed the bridge. I don't remember what that zone was called, maybe challengers, a bridge, or something like that, but he theorized when one person crosses, they have to 1v1 the guy with the sword. That still took us a little bit to get past since every person had to get a feel for the fight which was dangerous and I think I recall the guy would one shot you at your level if you even took a single hit from any ads. After a while and with determination, you were on to the thrall way. So, Vaults of Glass, like we previously discussed, had pieces of downtime to recollect what you had just conquered, and it was full of exploration to reap the best rewards from hidden places like secret chests. Vaults of Glass always had us wondering what was next. What extras were there? Crota's End, on the other hand, was not about mystery or exploration. It was about frantics and close encounters. The raid to this point was no exception. It starts out in a dark frantic labyrinth, then without any downtime to collect secrets or talk about what just went down, you're on to the bridge. Now we talk about the Thrallway, another very close quarters encounter, but probably the shortest encounter ever made if you even want to call it an encounter. It's one that I struggled to really call an encounter, but hey, there's a chest so I guess I will. The Thrallway was frantic, but also more annoying than anything in my opinion, because if you messed up getting the chest, there was no way to go for it again. A one-time try. Unless you went to orbit. There was a large hallway full of Thrall with a Shrieker to start, but if you tried to just run through, you could not as the Shrieker would kill you, and the Shrieker put up an invisible wall so you could not pass through it without killing it. The way to get through, of course, was killing that Shrieker and then the other one further down the hallway. Shriekers by today's standards are much less of a problem, but back then, I think we can all agree these were the most annoying regular enemies in Destiny. No critical hitbox, auto-tracking where you were, did tons of damage, and once you killed them, they exploded with void darts that tracked you for seemingly miles on end. If you did make it past here intact, running full speed through the hallway, the door at the end was closing fast. Most teams on day one didn't even know the door existed, considering most of them thought going slow was the best option. But if you did get the chest, a potential exotic was waiting for you. I had a bad rep for falling in the pit below though, so that's, that, that, that's unfortunate. Now. Once you fell down into the pit below, it was time for our final room, but not the last encounter. Er you, the Death Singer. To me, this is where the raid really begins. 
Yes, the labyrinth is atmospherically. Wait, is that even a word? Atmospherically impressive by all means. But this is when we actually have a boss fight, kind of. This phase required Team Invigorate and all of us to kill Ur Ute, the Death Singer, who is inside the big crystal room and shielded off from the team. When you enter the area, a message pops up that states, the Death Singer prepares her song. This let you know it was time to collect some tags and shred through the ads. This was not easy as there were level 31 enemies everywhere, from boomer knights in the towers to sword knights on the bridge, acolytes everywhere, and wizards to come. In order to fight Uryut, Team Invigorate needed to lure out the wizards from both sides, then kill them. After each wizard dies, a shrieker will activate on either side of the crystal chamber that had to be dealt with. Here's the catch though. After 2 minutes and 40 seconds, Uryut started the Liturgy of Ruin, which was a death counter that lasted 30 seconds. If Uryut is not killed before the Liturgy of Ruin is complete, the team would die. This is where I imagine Team Invigorate spent a lot of their time in that 7 hour run. Having to deal with a time crunch before being wiped was a new concept to Destiny to my knowledge, and these adds weren't easy to kill at all. But once they made it through both Wizards and Shriekers, the Crystal Chamber opened up and Uryut could be slain. This was a race to the finish to even get near the Death Singer, and now you had to throw everything you had at the boss to finish the job. I lied. They had uh, no, no struggle here at all. Once Team Invigorate finally did, however, it was time for the legendary Hive Prince, who decimated Eris and her fire team before, Crota, son of Oryx. Oh, my tits are literally rock hard right now. Crota, this legendary Hive Prince and the only known son to Oryx, the antagonist of the entire Dark Below, and a face we have only seen through stories and stones. It was time to take him down once and for all. To start the fight, Team Invigorate was to have all six be touching the crystal in the middle. Then, Crota was to rise, and rise he did. The fight started with hives surrounding your team at all sides and Crota lurking in the background underneath this amazing looking Eye of Sauron oversoul in the background. After the doors opened and Team Invigorate slayed out all these tough ads for day one, something was very noticeable. During this entire fight, a debuff would be activated called the Presence of Crota, which prevents normal health regeneration. Now, how do you heal? You were supposed to grab health by claiming the Chalice of Light, an item which spawns under Crota and may be held by one player at a time. Picking up the Chalice or taking it from another player will immediately trigger regeneration and holding it will allow regeneration to work normally. But any kind of health regen armor or red death would do really really well here too. Once these adds were cleared, two Boomer Knights stood in the towers on the sides. Killing both was a bad idea, as a sword knight would spawn, making it more annoying for your team later on. So how do you deal with Crota, this big bluish green raid boss, a mix between both sword bearer and gatekeeper that is? A sword bearer would spawn underneath Crota and by the chalice. Once killed and sword picked up by your team's sword bearer, your fire team had to take down Crota's shield. But if you weren't fast about it, Crota regened it almost immediately. Once the 3, 2, 1, take it down was called out by the sword bearer, it was time to take down the shield, putting Crota on one knee and the sword runner on your team to do damage. Were you going to use triggers for the slams? 
bumpers for light attacks or the wombo combo up to you and if you died with the sword because you didn't call it out in time or if your team was too late to shoot the shield down or if crota just did this You had an oversoul to kill. This giant green fireball which needed to be shot if a teammate died was Crota's oversoul, and if left alive it would take away all supers and wipe your team. I believe this mechanic was built to prevent self res from overpowering the encounter since warlocks could just simply bring themselves back to life if they died. Anyways, once you get Crota to half health, ogres came from the side rooms. Most teams camped in the spawn rooms and waited to take them out. Once they were dead and Crota crotated back to his platform, it was time to finish the job. For Invigorate, this was the real challenge of the raid as Hawkeye told me. Matrix, a player who wasn't even on the day one team, leveled his gear as high as possible so he could be prepared for this moment. When they got to Crota, they were trying a lot of different stuff. They had to explore the whole area to see if they were missing anything since Crota was invulnerable. Eventually, they just decided to shoot him a bunch and that worked, obviously. Hawkeye told me that he was carrying the sword and was running behind Crota with it while the rest of the team knocked him down. By the time they decided to try subbing in Matrix, Hawkeye had the timing mastered. He could get Crota to fall while he was in the process of swinging at him every time so he could get the maximum amount of hits in each cycle. It just wasn't enough without knocking Crota down twice, so they decided to use Matrix to see if that made any difference in how much sword damage you could do since he was level 31 by that point. Obviously it made a big difference, and that's how they succeeded so quickly. They were the first team to actually reach Crota, at least to his knowledge, and they had some people who weren't in the raid paying attention to what other popular streamers were at the time and were all still at the bridge when they reached Crota. But thanks to Matrix prepping the way he did, Team Invigorate was able to take down Crota three hours before the next team, to Hawkeye's knowledge. Their strategy was the tunnel strategy underneath Uryut's room, and with the damage that Matrix provided, they were all set to win this raid. They used bubbles, they used golden guns to make orbs so that they could have super with the sword, etc, etc. After 7 hours, 581 deaths, and 7 total members because obviously Hawkeye had to drop out for Matrix for the final kill, Team Invigorate was the world's first to beat the raid. A huge accomplishment and I want to praise the team for their doing so with the most selfless act to win a raid race. You see, it's rare that a team subs out someone who was on fire to get the job done, but sometimes those sacrifices have to be made to become champions. A huge accomplishment, but one that would come with lots and lots of controversy. Not controversy from the clan that beat it, they did everything just fine. No, controversy of the raid itself. The raid was beaten in half the amount of time for sure, but players felt like there was a lack of polish on it, and oh my, was there ever. Look, I love the raid, but there is a reason lots of players joke about it and call it a strike. 
in the beginning it was very hard for sure and i think if you played destiny back then you knew it was not to be messed with we will get to the cheese and the controversy but just know that this raid was the only time in destiny 1 that two raids came out in the same year and why bungie wouldn't revisit this formula of more than one a year until destiny 2. what was your first experience with crota though what did you think about it let me know in the comments okay so evan what about the loot? Oh yeah, I thought you would never ask. I'm gonna lay it out on the table. Vault of Glass had the best raid loot of any raid ever made and it's impossible to compete. But I think that's another reason why Crota was seen as a downgrade outside of a couple of weapons. From the first encounter, you could get the gauntlets which came with a raid perk of their own called Hive Breaker, or Hive Destroyer, or Hive Striker, which all had a chance to give you an orb of light on Hive kills with either melees, grenades, or guns. Just remember, orbs for supers were large in Destiny 1 and gave you super much, much more often. The bridge to Crota gave you the chest piece with the unique perk Moment of Speed, which gave you increased reload speed when the Oversoul was active. The boots too which had the unique perk Swordbearer's Touch, which made it so when you held the sword relic you were much more agile. This trend of new perks on armor was a welcomed one and one that I want to see return again. Uryu dropped the class item which had no unique perk unfortunately, and Crota, well, Crota had the loot. Crota dropped the helmets for each class, and the perk with them was Moment of Power, which increased the damage to the Oversoul when active. Crota also had all of the normal mode weapons to my knowledge, and what I could find online because my memory isn't always perfect. Crota dropped the Arc Fusion Rifle, Light of the Abyss, the Void Shotgun Sword Breaker with Final Round on it, and all of these had Hive Disruptor, which did more damage to Hive Majors. Crota also had the Arc Machine Gun Song of Uryut, which had a very unique perk called Dark Breaker, which let you shoot through Hive Knight shields. The Solar Rocket Hunger of Crota had cluster bombs and tracking rockets with Hive Disruptor again, and finally for normal mode, the one legendary you were all waiting for, the Black Hammer. The weapon you may know today as the Whisper of the Worm was once a special ammo sniper with 23 shots total and the perk White Nail which would refill ammo on 3 consecutive headshots to an enemy or multiple enemies. This weapon was so good they made two different versions of it and two secret missions dedicated to it. This weapon even had its own video from me. I mean. Dang, this weapon shook the entire Destiny community and was the main reason everyone wanted to run Crota every single week. That and upgrade materials. The final pieces for normal mode were some cosmetics like the ship Light in the Abyss and the Shader Cryptographic as well as exotics and upgrade materials. Now, hard mode? Hard mode had different loot and yes, in fact, there was a hard mode. are tough at first glance, but hard mode raids are usually tough forever. Think about the raid but with added mechanics, tougher enemies, new spawns, and little changed corpse to them. Crota's end was no exception. Actually, 
For year one, I would say it was a huge leg up from normal on Life Vault to Glass in terms of new added features. The first encounter had hollowed thralls, which meant they were harder to kill, and ogres were now tougher to kill and roasted you on sight. Also, everything was level 33. So no joke when everyone was more than likely level 30 entering hard mode or 29. The bridge didn't change at all outside of the level bump to enemies again, but where the real change happened was with Ur Ute, who had given players much less time to complete the encounter and more enemies spawned with once again being level 33. Crota had some big changes though. Boomer Knights were now Hollowed Knights with more damage, and if you killed them both, a Wizard would now come out instead of a Sword Knight, which made it even more annoying to deal with. A Gatekeeper was now roaming down low, where Thrall spawned to stop players from hanging down low and away from adds. Also, Crota instantly enraged when he reached 20% health remaining. Now, of course, Ogres got a buff too, which made them much harder to kill, no revives unless someone had self-res, and Crota had a little more health to deal with. Hard mode was first beaten by Team 1 and Done in a very short 27 minutes and 2 seconds. job to them as this would become the trend for hard mode raids as they were more of a speed run and less about a new experience with few mechanics changing. Hard mode drops? How about all three primary adept weapons like the Word of Crota, or as I called it, the only weapon to get Thorn Quest done with the Void Burn, and Hive Disruptor along with Firefly and Speed Reload. The Fang of ur Ute, an ARC primary scout rifle with third eye to see the radar in high caliber rounds to do more damage. Oh, and we have the Solar Adept Auto Rifle, Abyss Defiant with perfect balance and focus fire for a slower, high impact auto rifle shot and high di- Nope. Nope. This time we have Lich Bane, the perk that had the chance to disorient wizards on hits. Take into account that wizards had shields that were solar too, and this gun is actually pretty cool. Not cool enough to replace Fatebringer for most players, but pretty cool nonetheless. Finally, Crota had some extra goodies too. He had the coolest shader to lots of people, Glowhu, which turned you blue like the gatekeepers, Bane of Darkness, which was another ship, and the S13 Grave Robber, which was another overclock sparrow like the Vault of Glass one. Crota did have one final item though, an exotic as rare as Mythoclast. This exotic item called the Crux of Crota. What was this for? This was to upgrade that pesky Husk of the Pit in Iodon Alley into an exotic. We will have a video dedicated to this story one day, but I want to stress that this was a pain to get from Crota and was just as hard to get drop as the Vex Mythoclast. This was a two-step process and was an experimental way to do a raid weapon, since the Crux was how you upgraded Iodon. Once you combined the Crux with Iodon, you now had the Necrochasm, an arc auto rifle which had the perk Cursebringer, which popped heads like a cursed thrall on kill. This weapon was a step down from the Vex on all counts, but was still a very very cool concept and was a fun chase. So that was hard mode in a nutshell, but I want to now talk about the absolute lovable mess that this raid was and how it was seen as controversial as far as raid content went. But before I get there, I want to ask, what was your favorite item from Crota's End? Let me know. Okay, on to the brokenness. <laughs> Crota's End was the raid that was in all rights a downgrade from the Vault of Glass, but it also was broken fun. 
Let me start by saying that this raid could be entirely soloed, and after you were leveled enough, it wasn't even hard to do so. We will have the story of Solo Crota for another video, but I want to quickly go through the cheeses. First encounter, you have Blink, just skip the first floor. You want to go to the end? Just get booped by the lamp explosion. Want to not deal with ads in the tunnel and the bridge? Sit on the rock to the side and nothing can touch you. The bridge to Crota? Sword fly over the stupid thing and kill one gatekeeper then just chill behind this thing while your teammates hide on top despawn the ads with icebreaker and then shoot the ads from a distance. Er Ute? Go above her and shoot immediately. Or stand under her with an AoE grenade and kill her. Crota? Well, Pull your ethernet cable or take out the disc and he will stay on one knee the whole time. This raid became a meme and was starting to be called a strike after all of this. And I can't really blame anyone for it. You can pretty easily solo Crota with a little thought and consistency. The first player to ever solo Crota was Slayerage or his YouTube channel, The Legend himself. And oh boy, I can't wait to talk about that story. Just know, this was groundbreaking. Beating the hardest activity in Destiny with only one person doing it was unheard of, and it started the whole community of challenge players from it. Crota became the laughing stock of raids for these reasons, and controversial in development time too. After Vault of Glass's showing of what Endgame could offer, Crota didn't improve on virtually anything. It was a downgrade in quality, scale, and started making people wonder if the development hell the game went through had to do with this. In an interview with the Kinda Funny podcast, Luke Smith, game director of Bungie, revealed that Crota's end was actually originally supposed to be combined with King's Fall and the Fogoth Strike, and the reason they didn't go with this was that the Vex were the main threat at the end of Vanilla Destiny, so a Hive raid that size wouldn't have made sense that soon after, but just imagine what this raid could have been like. Crota's end and King's Fall were um, one thing. Like they started off as like one mega concept that then we we had to like split and we had to shelve because the, the end of the game was about the Vex and, was, and I was like, the, the raid has to be about the Vex then too. So we had this big hive thing that we wanted to do. We, we like paused that and then um, built this, this whole new raid. Either way, Crota would not be finished as he would make another appearance in the Taken King and Rise of Iron. was not done. In fact, Crota appeared a lot in Destiny, like in the Court of Oryx and in this really sad, sad video. Crota even had a funeral in the Taken King with these loud footsteps. Like, I'm in an ASMR yeah, I feel like Jesus, dude. Oh when you get close, <laughs> <So loud. laughs> my ears, dude. I don't remember this fish being so loud, bro. Wow. And Crota found his way into the remastered Age of Triumph raid too, with some changes. The first change was this amazing-looking gear again with the ornaments. Please bring these back or do new sets with these. Thank you, Bungie, you have my money on that, thank you. The next change was that the bridge to Crota now had more gatekeepers to kill. Five of them were needed to be killed in order to pass, and on the fifth death, a bunch of swords spawned to kill more gatekeepers. Did I mention mostly all bugs were patched here too? You needed to have five people make it instead of cheese this, and the ur -Ute encounter had more adds and a unique challenge to it, which was to kill ur -Ute with a sword relic. 
This meant killing everything in the room except Uryut, which would spawn a sword bearer. Grabbing the relic and killing Uryut was how this challenge was to be beaten, and it was not easy. The final challenge was Crota, who would now spawn with the Oversoul every time he went down on one knee, and the challenge was to only be able to hold the sword once and wasn't all too hard compared to some other raid challenges. But the Age of Triumph was phenomenal for the armor and some additions to the raid that fixed a lot of the jank. But just don't bring up wall breaching. <laughs> hold on, dude, again? Bro, fix your f***ing legs! <laughs> I don't know, bro. <laughs> We're doing the crab walk? Ew! Ew! Nope. Fix it. your f***ing... Yep. Stop swimming, dude! He's doing yoga, dude. Finally, Crota would reappear in Destiny 2 as a nightmare in Shadowkeep. Nothing really special as a reward for beating him, but the legend would live on. to say about this raid other than it was a beautiful disaster in terms of raid content to follow and raid content previously. Crota was the depiction of development hell for the team at Bungie, but Crota is also what started the trend of can we solo this raid boss? Crota is significant in the way we look at small raids in the series and is significant when it comes to where the game's direction of raids went after. So that begs the question, would you like to see this raid remastered? My answer, like all other answers to this question about remastered Destiny 1 content, is always no. I believe that the best course of action is one we already have been a part of. Take inspiration and make new experiences that built upon the foundation of the good that came before. I mean hell, Crota basically has a remaster in the campaign and as a nightmare, so I guess Bungie already did this. Did it feel as satisfying as the first time though? Probably not. I will be making a video talking about the solo Crota and the world record progression in the future, but for now I will leave you with some words and then the bloopers. Crota is the most controversial raid ever made, but I amend the team at Bungie for making a raid that has an identity very different from the Vault of Glass as it sets itself apart and establishes a different atmosphere. I think Crota accomplished what it set out to accomplish, but maybe what it set out to accomplish wasn't enough for players. Either way, the next raid would silence any critic of the game and would prove to be a gold standard, and we will be talking about it soon. But if you did enjoy this video, a like would be greatly appreciated as well as a subscription. You can talk about Destiny, the raids, lore, future videos, other games, and way way more on my Twitch channel, the link to that will be at the top in the description. Anyways everyone, enjoy the bloopers and I will see you next time, peace! Y'all gotta do it again. Go. Wait, jump. wait, wait. Jump, jump, jump. Go, 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 Yo, I got fingers in you and I was like, this is not a go. I'm out. I got the AZ! 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 I'm putting the dislike on your next video, idiot. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> Can't touch me. Are you... I'm, I'm like, I'm angry and I'm laughing at the same time. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs>
Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Get on, idiot! Dog, get out of my lobby! No! You are going down, baby. In the most majestic fashion possible. Alright, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go to the deep voice, deep voice.